Hi, everyone. Welcome to, to, to today's masterclass on data analytics. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Lauren, and I've been at MathWorks for over 30 years. I try to share my knowledge in classes like today's. You might also find some useful MATLAB tips on the blog that I maintain, The Art of MATLAB. Let's get started on this week's topic. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna um, uh, speak about uh, data analytics today. Um, I have some uh, MathWorks um, uh, friends who are on the YouTube chat, so please feel free to uh, put your questions there and they'll either answer them or uh, shoot them my way when it makes sense. And um, I'm just ready to go. So um, uh, in a perfect world, I would be able to ask you some questions but instead I'm gonna tell you what I normally see because I can't really do that right now. Um, so um, what is data analytics? Well, before I answer that, um, let me talk about where data analytics are found. And they're found everywhere where there's any sort of technical computing required, whether it's in um, transportation type systems, whether it's in energy based systems, whether it's in medical sort of things, um, and also in less traditionally technical areas, uh, whether it's retail and finance and logistics, things like that. So um, what, are, what do these things all have in common? Well, they have problems at heart that have a lot of data associated with them, and they'd like to mine that data for information. And so the idea here is with data analytics is we're gonna to try to turn large volumes of data into something we can take action on. And in order to get from, a data, from the data that we have to some decision, the first thing we need to do is figure out what happened. So we need to look at the data and sort of describe what we think we see. And then we need to sort of figure out why we think it happened. We then maybe wanna make a model so that what we can do is predict what will happen next. And if what's gonna happen next is what we want, well, we, we don't need to do anything. But suppose it's not. Suppose it's something we don't wanna have happen, then we need to do something about changing, um, changing the situation so um, a different outcome can happen. So that's the idea behind data analytics. And there's a very typical workflow. The very first thing is, we have to get access to our data. And the data, thankfully in MATLAB, can come from anywhere. It can come from files, local files, databases, sensors with live data, internet of things, databases on another system. As long as you can reach them, um, MATLAB will be able to capture that information that you ask for. After we get access to the data, and I, I, again, this is a place where I'd love to ask a question. For those of you who've worked with data, how perfect is your data? Perfect, right? That's what people would like to think. Well, not so much, okay? So we often have messy data and it's often not our fault. It's just the way the world is. Okay, so when I'm thinking about this, what I might need to do is I might need to pre-process the data. And depending on what kind of data it is, you're gonna do different things. You know, if it's, a, if it's an image, you might need to remove a shadow. If it's a signal, you might need to re remove um, like a 60 or 50 Hertz signal that is not really the thing you're interested in. In any case, you may have large amounts of data and they might come from multiple sources. And it may be so large that you decide to do something to transform the data and make it into a smaller data set that still encapsulates the important details of the process you're trying to understand and affect. And so you might do some data reduction. One kind of way, it's not usually considered data reduction, but one sort of way of doing that is feature extraction. You can look for features. If I were looking at um, images, for example, of drinking vessels, like you can see here in the plot, um, I could look for things with handles and without handles. And that might help me decide whether, maybe in the context of other information, whether it's a coffee cup or a beer mug or, or what, a teapot or whatever. After we get the data into a form that we are happy with and that represents the system well, we need to think about creating a model. Now, one thing, that um, you may not know about me is my background is in physics. And so I'm used to knowing the equations of things because of people like um, 
uh, Maxwell and Gauss and Einstein and so on. So I know my equations. And because I know my equations, typically what I'm doing is I'm just going to find and fit parameters, like how much is the mass of the Earth, for example. And I'm going to use the data to help estimate those. But there's often a case where we have a lot of data that has really great information in it, but we don't know the physics behind it. And for those, we use statistical models or machine learning models typically. In either case, once we get a model, we have to figure out whether that model makes sense. Um, you know, I, I taught university for a little while and I would get homeworks back from people and you'd ask, you know, um, what is the value for something? And you expect it to be, you know, three times 10 to the 10, and they give you an answer of pi. So clearly there's a big disconnect. They didn't even check to see that their model was in the right ballpark because the numbers are so big, it's so, uh, so hugely different from one another. So this is really key, making sure our model really is going to be a predictor for what we need so that we can rely on it. Now I'm gonna argue if you stop right there, um, you will have had a really fun day at the office or at home or wherever you're working these days um, because you haven't told anything about what you've done. Now, um, I know many of you may be signing up from universities. Um, one of the things you might need to do if you're not the professor is you might need to hand in some sort of homework or paper or thesis. If you are the professor, you might be writing and even, even if you're a student, you might be writing papers for journals. You might be giving talks. There's a lot of different ways you might present your results to other people. And in fact, you might present the results in another system. You might make, make a, uh, an app for someone to explore that keeps your information, your model inside it. And you may deploy that app to the desktop or to an enterprise scaling, uh, an enterprise system. And if you need to, you can use external code uh, to link in with MATLAB to make things glue together well. And you also might choose to take the information you have and um, deploy it to embedded devices and hardware. Um, but that action of telling other people actually completes the flow. And the nice thing is, is that all of these pieces are available in MATLAB. We can use the data to tell a story and we can share tools and programs and artifacts along the way in different formats, depending on what's useful. Um, now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna motivate the example I'd like to talk about. Um, and um, for that, I'm gonna bring up MATLAB, which I need to find here. Don't do that to me. Here, okay. So this is my MATLAB, and I happen to have um, a live script open. In case you don't know what live scripts are, I'm gonna explain them in a moment, but I wanna tell you about a problem that I wanna solve. And here you can see one dashboard, a picture of a website. Unfortunately, the websites aren't working today, so I can't go to them. Um, and on this website, you'll see the state of New York. And what we'll see here is the, um, uh, Last two days energy load there, um, what's come out of the power plant, and then a prediction for what's gonna happen in the next 24 hours. I have another different app that's very similar. And what you see in this app is still the same 11 different distinct regions in New York in which the energy grid is broken up into. And you see the prior two days energy load, and then you see a forecast for tomorrow, including uncertainty. Also on this map, um, once I see a region, uh, you'll also notice that there's red stars on there. And those red stars represent the locations where there's weather stations. So why do I care about weather stations for this problem? Well, we're in a very sweet time of year from my perspective where I live, which is in um, the Massachusetts area, northern in New England. And it's a beautiful day today. But in the summer, there were some days that were super hot over 30 degrees centigrade and very humid. And guess what I wanted to do those days? I wanted to turn my air conditioner on. Now, I don't need to turn it on. I might even need to turn it on if the temperature is 28 or maybe even 26 if it's really humid. But if it's 
30 and it's really dry out, I might not need it, especially if there's a breeze. And so my energy consumption, I'm going to argue, is going to be um, controlled at least in part by what the weather's doing outside, the temperature and the humidity. But there's also other things. You can see there seems to be a daily signal in this. And that's because at night, most of us um, are not using nearly as much power and electronics. Um, we might these days, I don't know quite how it works at home, but normally uh, pre-COVID, we would go and um, I would go to the office or I would be at a customer site. And so at home, I wasn't using a lot of power um, during the day, the middle of the day. And I also wasn't using power in the middle of the night, um, but I was using it in the morning when I was getting ready to get up and make breakfast and before I left. And then when I came home and cooked dinner and did laundry and watched TV and that sort of thing. So we have a natural daily cadence, I think, for some of the power that we use. And so what I'd like to do is show you how I um, would look at the data for this um, and how I might want to um, do that. Now, I told you that we have um, the load here and the load we simply get from this location, you'll have the link when um, you'll see the link here. Um, and it's the New York Independent System Operators um, location. And if you come here, you see they have pricing information about the because, of course, power costs money. And we have the power grid outages and things like that. And then you see we have the actual load data and we have the real time actual load. And if I click on that, what you see is a website that has the last 10 days of um, CSV, comma separated value files, and then um, archived month by month, a whole month's worth of files going back quite a few years here. Okay, well, I really would like to get a lot of this data. I'm assuming that if I understood the patterns from before, they would help me, of, of, power, of, load, of load usage, they would help me predict how much load would be there we would need tomorrow. Well, who cares about that? Well, first of all, the, um, the people who monitor and run the grids care about that because they have access to several different generators for making the uh, power. And so they may um, say, oh, we need more power tomorrow. I better turn on another generator. Or it could be in a situation in the summertime where they go, oh my goodness, we need more power tomorrow and we're using every generator we've got. So now, then what do they do? Well, what they do is they call Hydro-Quebec, our neighbor, and say, we need to buy some energy for, for tomorrow. And so they're using it. These energy operators are using it to predict the load that they'll need and make sure that they have enough so that they don't run out. Now, think about the people in Canada at that point. What are they doing? They also want to know whether someone here is going to want to buy more energy from them. They're going to want to know because if they see it coming that it's going to be super hot and humid in New York and Massachusetts and all that, and they're going to get all of these calls to sell energy, well, they're not, um, they're not in business um, for no good reason. They're in business, among other things, to make some money. So they may want to raise the price when they see that happen. So different people might want to say the same information for different reasons. Okay, so that's one piece of information. The other piece of information that I have here is um, uh, a location on the NOAA, the National Organization um, uh, Oceanographic uh, and Atmospheric Association. This is basically where the weather service is hosted in the US. And you'll see for each month, um, well, I, yeah, for each month I have uh, of uh, years starting in 1996, I've got a, a basically a compressed file with all the information. So somehow I have to get all these data sets down to me so that I could begin to model. Well, if I come back to this New York independent system operators, you know how to do this. I could click on this and download one and download two. Well, I got to tell you, um, I would be bored pretty quickly and I would probably make a mistake and I'd skip one and I'd download another month twice. And um, you can see it's a fairly long list. And so I might really mess that up. So what I'd like to do instead, if I can, is see if I can automate getting that data so that um, 
uh, I'm sure I have all the data that we need. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back to MATLAB to talk about this. And um, now I'm gonna show you, this is the, the live script. This is actually MATLAB executable code. Um, for the benefit of those who haven't seen it before, this is called a live script, your regular scripts. Um, were functions or were files that ended in .m. You'll see this one ends in .mlx um, for live. And um, it's a way of creating text that is a formatted document. It looks like, you know, uh, a PDF you might create or um, a Word document or you know, name your choice of how you'd like to do it. And you'll see here that we can put in um, pictures here and I can put in bulleted lists. I told you that some of the factors that are going to matter, that the load is going to depend on, are going to be the time of the day and the weather. Um, and so what we did is originally we built this web application so that people could um, just go to it without needing to know MATLAB necessarily, click on one of the regions, and then find out the forecast for the next day by looking here. Okay, and you'll notice because of that, we have links in here. I've got embedded pictures. I don't actually have a formula in this case. If I had a formula, I could put it in though. Let me come here. I suppose I actually had a formula and, and, and knew that it was you know, weather squared plus uh, time of day or something like that. I can come and in, from the live editor, I can insert many different things. And one of the things you'll see that I can insert are equations and I can insert um, a LaTeX equation. I'm not super great at LaTeX because between you and me, I graduated with my PhD before LaTeX it was invented. So I'm okay with it, but not great. But I'm going to show you can do it either way. I'm going to use the point and click choice here. And what you'll see is I have a palette of a lot of different mathematical symbols beyond the usual ones that we have. And so I can start, I can even start typing X equals and I can say omega. Um, times r or whatever I want. And I can then say times, and I can come over here and I can put in, um, I like the nth root. I'm gonna put an nth root and let me put in uh, the 17th root of, um, and let me do x minus, no, no, we don't want x. We want, um, uh, where did it go? Omega minus on the omega, I'm gonna go squared here. Okay, that, so that's one way I could put an equation in. Now, um, that's really useful because if I were to say the equation in words, it wouldn't be nearly as easy to understand as if you just see it and then you can double check to make sure that it makes sense. Um, I can also put in um, uh, arrays. So if I want to, I can put in an equation again and if I want to, I can put in matrices and I can say, I just want a two by two. And in the same way I filled in things before, I can fill in things now. Um, and so I can communicate the math to people because that's one piece of the communication. Um, there's the mathematics, there's the prose, there's the pictures, there's the code. These are all important and some are important to different people depending on what their role is. Okay, so the live script lets me put all this together. And because I sometimes forget, I'm gonna jump ahead for a moment. If I get all done with this and I have this document exactly the way I want it, I can come here and do a save as, and you'll see, or an export, and you'll see, I can export this to any kind of document, um, PDF, Word, HTML, or LaTeX. So you can get these artifacts out of MATLAB and share them with other people. So that's one way you can do the sharing and communication and people can be very clear on what code you actually ran. Okay, now um, I'm up to the point where I'm explaining what we're gonna do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the, live, the data that I showed you from those websites, the historical data for the load and for the weather. And then we're gonna look at it and we're gonna find that it's a little bit messy, not surprisingly. What surprised me actually is that the load data is actually fairly clean. Um, no, no, it's not. The weather data is actually fairly clean. Um, um, and then I'm gonna wanna merge the data and the, the load data I am told um, is recorded every five minutes. The weather data is recorded once an hour. 
So this again is not atypical for things that happen when you're collecting data from different sources. We've got to rationalize that somehow. And then we've got to pull out predictors for um, uh, what might be important um, when uh, I go to do my predictions. So we know the time of day might be important. I told you why, but you know, does it matter if it's Monday or Tuesday or Saturday or Sunday? Well, it might, okay? And the reason it might, if I'm thinking about it, is my behavior is different on different days of the week. So Monday through Friday, at this point, I normally am at home working most of the day. And Saturday and Sunday, while it's nice weather, I get outside and I'm not home most of the day. So my energy use might be very different because of that. So day of the week might matter. There's other things that might matter. And so we want to basically pull apart the signal in terms of its time constituents in some ways and see which ones are important and which ones may not be. And once we figure out which ones we think might be important, we want to take that and train a model for it so that we can make predictions for the future load and see how well it works. So I am actually not going to run the next pieces of code here. Um, uh, I'm just gonna to come to the next section. This is like regular MATLAB code. It has sections as well, um, because I always make sure I've downloaded the data beforehand just in case. And I'm actually going to, at the moment, um, uh, minimize my tool strips so you can see a little more in my command window here. And what you'll see here is I'm gonna make a directory if it doesn't exist, but I think I already have it open. That's, here it is. And you can see that it's gonna make a, a directory called data sample. Well, I already have that made here. So we'll go in there. And then what I'm doing is I am, um, oops, let me go like that. Um, then what I'm doing is I wanna get um, a year's worth of data in this case. It doesn't really matter what you get, but I want just a year because each season may have different characteristics of how we, how much time you spend indoors and outdoors and things of that sort. So I'm gonna go from February, 2005 through January, 2006. And notice when I do that, I go in steps of a calendar month. So this takes away the burden from me when dealing with dates and times of having to remember which month has 30 and which month has 31 days and whether or not it's a leap year and so on. And leap seconds, all that sort of stuff is just taken care of there. And so those are the dates of the files that I want to get, one per each month. And so if I, um, if I were going to uh, do this, I don't want to do that. Don't do that. Um, uh, I, have my, I have four cores on my laptop here, and you'll see I have four workers. I put, my, I put um, them all to work behind the scenes here. And so if I have a big enough pipeline to the internet, instead of downloading one file at a time, I could choose to download as many as it will let me, in this case, four perhaps, because I have four different cores there. And so that's why instead of, I'm using a par four instead of a for loop, a parallel for loop, so that if it can go faster by doing things in parallel, it will in this case. And so what I'm doing is I'm just building up the full names of the files. And you can see the last time this ran, I have the output left here from when my colleague ran it the last time. And one of the things you'll notice here is that we got all 12 files down, we constructed the file name we were gonna get, and we had put together the URL. So it has the same file name on the website as it has here, but I have to give the URL for finding the data and a location where I wanna put the data when I'm done and I'm gonna download it. So when I download it, you'll see we don't necessarily download in order, but that's okay because I still have all the files. But with a par four, you can't assume things are being done in order. So each time through the par four loop is an independent, must be an independent um, action. Now, having put together the file name and the file destination, you'll see I'm using the function web save. If you don't know what web save does, you can um, uh, choose, uh, select it and get help on web save. And let me come over here and show you here I have the uh, math, math lab documentation for web save. And one of my favorite things to look at is see also. 
C also tells you many things. First of all, it was introduced in 2014. And it tells you other things that might be interesting, web write and web read. Well, web save actually is um, uh, doing something. It's saving the file rather than reading it into MATLAB right now. And you give it the file name where you want to place it and the destination it's coming from. And there's my favorite part, though. Um, well, I, it's tied between see also and examples. Um, if there's an example that does what you want, you don't necessarily have to read the full description and everything about every input argument. You might need to, to get some details about it, but it might just save you a lot of time and you can just copy and paste a little bit of code and modify it for your use. Okay, um, so we've got our files here. And in fact, if I bring back that folder that I had open a moment ago, where'd it go? Here, come on, here it is. Um, you'll see, that the last thing I did in this um, uh, area is I, for, for the length of the dates that I have, which is uh, 12 of them, I unzipped them. And if so I look in my hist load directory, I actually have more unzipped than that because I, I got more data at one point. Um, but I also have um, uh, all the days for a whole bunch of different months. I have, you know, the 31st um, or the January 31st, January 29th, January 30th, all of 2006 and so on. So I've got a bunch of data there um, that's downloaded. And so I can do that without worrying that I'm going to miss a file because of um, making a mistake clicking it. And we can automate a, a tedious task that way. Okay, but now I have this mess of files that I need to think about. And I want to think about how to, um, how to think about them. So I'm going to come to this next section. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to clear all the output um, from the last time this was run. So I don't have anything in my workspace right now, and I don't have, I haven't run anything yet. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take that directory with the historical loads, and I'm gonna take all of those CSV files, and I kinda of wanna think of them as one long, skinny um, uh, time sequence of how much load was used every five minutes for days and days and days on end. And so, what I can do instead of having to manage all the data myself is I can first find out what data is there. One way to find out what's there, let me come back to make this big, is I can run a section. And when I run a section, we see the output there and I can see that I have my D there. I have 365 days. And if I hover here, maybe I turned that off, I don't know. Okay, and I can come here. And what I'm gonna do in this case is say, I want to, um, oh, let me come over here, actually. Let me go, no, yeah, let me go this other way. Okay, let me open one of these files. So here's one of these files, um, and I'm just gonna make the columns a little bit bigger so that you can see. I've got um, uh, five columns of data, the timestamp, and you'll see we have a bunch of things that were all on January 31st, 2006 at midnight. And then we go, that's uh, st uh, lines two through um, 12. So that's 11 of them. Funny, I have 11 regions, right? In New York, I told you. And then I have uh, starting at 13 and going for another 11, five minutes after the hour, and then 10 minutes after the hour. And you'll see time zone. Um, and maybe I don't really need that information because New York is always in the same time zone with each other. They're all together. But you'll see the next column, um, which is the name of the region is um, capital. That's where Albany is and central and so on. And then at five minutes past, we start repeating them with capital and central, central, central and Dunwoody again. And, and if I don't want to think about the name, I can use an ID to represent each one of those 11, region, 11 regions. Um, personally, I like the name because I know the geography, so I kind of know where New York City is and where the capital is and so on. So it's a little more meaningful to me. So I maybe don't need D either. And then I need the data, surely the load. Okay, so when I read in the data, um, uh, I want to think about how to read all these as an ensemble rather than reading them one by one. And for that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna refer to the historical load um, the data in historical load uh, as a data store. 
And this basically will let it me aggregate all the data and uh, be able to read it all at once. And you'll notice that I'm gonna do um, uh, a date time for the first column um, and then two capital C's for the next two columns. Here's a preview of them, the uh, uh, time zone and the um, uh, actual energy zone, then the load. These two happen to be strings, but they're finite strings. So I'm gonna make them categorical with the capital C so that I don't have to store the same string many, many times. And then these are floating point numbers. And so I can come here and say, but you know what? I really don't want all of that data. I want um, just columns one, timestamp, three, name, and load. You'll notice timestamp doesn't match timestamp because when I go to run this, and this is another way to run is to stick my uh, mouse in the blue area and uh, click it, I get a warning that the variable name was not valid because it has a space in it. And so all MATLAB did was squeeze the space out. And so now what I'm gonna do is, because I can, I'm gonna read in the whole data set at once. And it's gonna take a little bit of time because there's, even though it's not only one year's worth of data and not like 20 years worth of data, it's a fair amount of data. So now while we're waiting, you can see um, in my workspace, I've got the data and my raw data is um, about a million lines long and three columns. Okay, so here's, I can just look at the top of it and you can see I've got timestamp and if I hover in my table, you can see, I can see all the times they're all the same. And these first eight are different um, names and I've got the loads here. So I read in the data. I always like looking at it to make sure I'm successful. Um, but you know, I, if I just look at five numbers, I'm not sure I've got it right. So what I often wanna do is take a better look at the data. Well, let me remind you what the data looked like. It looked like um, 11 uh, data values for time zero and followed by 11 data values by time five, followed by 11 at time 10 minutes and so on. And that's a little bit awkward. I'd kind of like to think about my data as um, time zero, five, 10, 15, and so on, and one column for capital and one for central and so on. And so I'd like to take each 11 and turn them on the side and stack them that way, actually unstack them. And that's the, the terminology that's used in databases. So we borrowed it and I'm gonna unstack the load data um, according to the name now. And uh, it also had some uh, names that didn't make sense because New York City was n.y.c and you can't have dots and MATLAB names. And I'm gonna change the first name, which was timestamp to date here. And now you see a preview of the first 12 of my um, times. So we have five min zero minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then you'll see Capital, Central, Dunwood, and so on. And I can go through and if the, um, what I'm trying to show in the live script is bigger than the amount we wanna take up space, then you can scroll through it. Now, if I were gonna take this and do my save, it would actually show in an expanded way, for example, in a PDF, it would show all 12 rows. But look at row number two. Does this bother you? For the state of New York at five minutes after the hour, of midnight on January 31st, no one needed any power anywhere. Seems like there's a problem with the data collection somehow. The problem is of course, we don't know how often that happened and what other problems we may encounter. So what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to take a look at a piece of the signal. And so what I'm gonna do is just take the whole signal first and I'm gonna use something that's relatively new in MATLAB and I'm gonna call um, stack plot on it. And it's thinking, cause it's got, remember, a lot of data points in there. And here we have a plot. Now notice in my live script, the output has been coming into my script. I could choose to have this come after, the output come after each section that I'm running, or I can have it be side by side so that I can see what's going on. And it's really a preference up to you. 
I, and you can also suppress all of the code if you want to. I don't want to at the moment. I definitely want to show it to you. But here is my um, signal that's visualized. Notice also with this plot that um, I can do things like I can start moving my mouse here, and then we can read for all 11 regions what the um, load was at any given time. And now you'll also see we notice a lot of places where there's these zeros at other uh, times. And then we also happen to see maybe some spikes up at various times. And um, I could uh, zoom in. And when I zoom in, it zooms in on the entire plot that I've got. And if I want to, I could update the code. And it will just put the code in for me, saving me the time if it's the way that I would like to see it. OK, and if I want to, I can control Z and undo that. And we can hide the code there at the moment. And in fact, I can just double click, I think. I'm being a little bit silly somehow. Well, OK. I thought I could click and go back. But at any rate, um, I can run that section again, though, and get us back where we were. All right. The next thing I want to do is I want to take advantage of the fact that MATLAB actually knows about dates and times much better than it did before. Um, so if you've got timestamp data and you're not using the date time functionality in MATLAB or the timetable functionality, you might really want to look into it. So I want to ask the question, is my data... Remember, I said they told me that the data was um, sampled every five minutes. So I like to trust, but I don't completely. I want to verify, too. And so that's why I'm going to ask in this timetable if the data is regular, and it's not. So this is kind of a bummer, right? Because I've got three problems with my data right now. So I have messy data, OK? I've got zeros in my data that really don't seem to make sense. I might have some spikes in my data. And now it's not even sampled every five minutes. So I've got to figure out how I want to work on this so that I have the most cleaned up, reasonable data I could have. Um, and I'm going to select a region that I could clean. And you'll see with this drop down, which is a user control that I can insert here, um, that I can choose. I could. I'll program it so that it's any one of my 11 regions. I'm going to leave it on Dunwoody. And I'm going to capture the data into what I call the clean signal, which of course it isn't yet. Um, but what I want to do is I want to select the data and, um, and take a look at it. And so um, while MATLAB's computing this, it's going to make my plot. And here's the raw data for the Dunwoody region. And you can see I have a whole host of zeros there, way more than I even maybe anticipated from seeing that um, stack plot before. And we can see a bunch of spikes. Now, when I think about spikes here and I think about energy use, you know, a lot of times, if we're sitting at the dinner table, what we were doing five minutes ago is kind of what we're doing now. So you don't expect rapid changes and then to rapidly change back again in no time at all. So these spikes are also a bit suspicious. And so I need to think about how I'm going to clean things up. Now, there are a ton of functions in MATLAB signal processing toolbox and stuff that you may or may not know about that can help you do this. Oh, I want to show you something else while I'm here. Um, another thing that I can do is I can do um, a, a constrained zoom. And look at the dates. My dates go from um, March through January because I have a year's worth of data. So February is not listed there, but it's there. If I go like this, what you'll see is MATLAB is smart about the dates and it will zoom in appropriately. Whoops. Um, zoom in appropriately and it will let you zoom sort of to your heart's content. Now you can see we have some interesting spikes and things. We have a double spike a um, couple hours apart there. Okay, so um, I can um, uh, look at the data and now I need to think about using the data. Um, and cleaning it up. And one of the things that I could do, I showed you there were controls. When I showed you that control, I didn't show you what other controls there were. There, I can put in numeric sliders, check boxes, buttons, and edit fields. We also recently introduced something whoops, called um, tasks. 
And here are the tasks. I'm running the latest version of MATLAB, R2020B. 2020, and you can see I have a bunch of tasks in MATLAB that allow me to do um, data pre-processing, clean missing data. Wow, that's going to help. Um, clean outlier data, that's going to help. Smoothing it, maybe. I'll explain why that might make sense. And I could potentially use um, synchronizing tables maybe later on. Um, and then there's also tools from other products that may help you as well. So I'm going to come here and I want to remove the zeros. And instead of removing the zeros, I choose to put in the clean missing data um, task here. So clean missing data is here. I fill in the data that I want. I'm going to tell it what I want the input to be. It's going to come from my clean signal. And I need to tell it what part of the signal. And it's the load. And the x-axis, I want to be date. And I, can, I want to fill the missing. And I can choose how to fill the missing. And I can do linear interpolation in this case, um, max gap to fill, whatever you want. And then I want it to display both the clean data and the filled missing entries. And here we have the plot that comes out of it. Now, that's all nice and magic. Um, and, um, and then I can take my missing data and I can put that back into my clean signal when we're done, clean missing. Now, what if I wanted to show this to someone, but they didn't need to see all this mess? What I can do is I can collapse this and they can just see this funny line of code that says clean missing is filled missing data in clean signal dot load using linear interpolation. You don't have to show that if you don't want. But if you're like me, once again, you might have a reason to want to see what code's behind it. And you don't want it to be something magical. And so I can click here again, and I can show the actual MATLAB code behind it if I would like. And so you can rest assured that we have um, the right thing. And if you see, you might, this is an opportunity to find out, well, here's a function I didn't know about. And you can come here and uh, fill missing. So I can come up here and we can say fill missing. And I will come to fill missing in MATLAB here. And I can look at the C also, because once there's missing values, there may be other things I want to do. This refers to the task, fill outliers. Is it missing? Remove the missing, standardize the missing. So a bunch of information I can get out of that. So I decided to fill the missing ones first, because if I change the time first and interpolate it somehow to, to, because the time is moving around, then my zeros might not be zeros. And so I might not fill something I meant to fill. So I'm doing the filling the missing first. And then I'm also going to clean the outliers with the same kind of idea with the clean outlier um, task here. Come on. Let me come here. Maybe it doesn't like that I've done that. I don't know. I don't think it should matter. But here I can come to the um, clean outlier data. And so that's what's embedded in here. We're going to take the clean signal, put it into the clean outliers. Same thing. We are going to have uh, date versus load. We're going to fill the outliers. We're not going to remove them. And I can do a moving median in this case um, with a threshold factor of um, three standard deviations. And I'm going to have the window be um, two hours wide. OK, and then I'm going to make a plot that shows you everything that happened to this data pretty much here. And what you see here in the dark, heavy blue is the cleaned data. What you see in a light blue, which you barely see because mostly the heavy blue is covering it, is the clean data. But you'll see a few little bits of the clean data here. Now, I'll also mark what outliers came out of this in X, and then the filled outliers with the red dots. And the outlier thresholds are in gray. And again, I could zoom in and we could see what's going on here if we wanted to. But we basically now have a clean signal for one, um, one year of one of the 11 regions. And this is just for the load so far. And now I'm going to argue that there's a lot of other stuff going on here that in any given day, maybe within an hour, we don't really care if something's happened and maybe you, you go off and you, um, you know, have something on your hairdryer on for a few minutes and then you turn it off. It's not that important. We can smooth the data out. And in fact, we're going to smooth the data out with the smooth 
data app that the task that's up there. Um, and we're going to use a moving median with the same time length. And the reason I'm doing the smooth data at this point is honestly because I already know and I told you that the other data, the weather data, is hourly. So we're not going to need every five minutes of data, but I might as well get a good estimate of the five minutes that, of, of the data that we get. And so smoothing it seems to be a fair thing to do at this point. Okay. So, and here I get my smooth data. So you can see that we're getting sort of some hourly um, jittery stuff that's going on around there. Okay. Now, I told you I had three problems. I had um, uneven sampling of the data. I had missing data with zeros and I had outliers. We fixed the missing data with zeros. We fixed the outliers. So now we need to regularize the timestamps. And um, first I can find out, okay, one thing I can do, I'm going to come here. And when I come here, another thing I could do is I could run and advance a section. And I use run and advance so often that if I right click here, you'll see it's grayed out. I added it already to my quick access tool strip here. And so I can minimize the tool strip now and I can come here and I can run this and go to the next section. Well, I'm gonna come back and see what the answers are for this section first. Okay, and so I'm gonna get um, the summary of the differences between the dates. So the differences between my five minutes, if they're all five minutes, my differences are all zero. But you'll notice or my, the, my differences are all five. But you'll notice my median difference is five minutes. My maximum difference is an hour and five minutes. And my minimum is one second. Well, one second, you know, could be jitter of some clock that's done something's gone weird for a little while. Okay, so what could I do? Well, I might wanna figure out why it's an hour and five minutes off. Suppose it's a legitimately an hour and five minutes off. What I can do is I can say, take the clean signal and in steps of five minutes, interpolate it with linear interpolation here. So I could do that and that's what I did here. But let me tell you something else. I smell a rat when something is too round a number. And an hour and five minutes is an exactly an hour more than my median difference. And so I'm wondering what's going on. And the actual fact is, is I lied to you before, sorry. And what I did was when I said we didn't need to worry about the time zone, we actually kind of do. Because in the US, we change our clocks twice a year in most locations, and New York is one of them. So if I'd looked through that file a lot more carefully or a different month of the file, instead of seeing EST the whole time, I would also see EDT for daylight savings time some of the time. And so if I had properly accounted for that and read that in as part of the date and time, we would not have a max of 105. We'd have a max of either five or five and a couple seconds or something like that. Okay. Um, and for the rest of what I'm going to do, I actually have the data properly um, accounting for daylight savings time. So there's no issues with the data going forward for that. The next thing, so I just did one station, one year um, out of, you know, 15 years or whatever. So I'm pretty sure you want to watch me do all the other 10 stations and for all of the years. Well, maybe not. Um, I actually have done that in advance, and so I've got that ready to go when we get to that point. Um, but now I need to think about the weather. Okay, and um, I'm going to come here, and I'm going to do the um, same idea that I had before. I'm going to do this run in advance, and here we're going to let it run, and I'm going to come back and show you the code. We have this directory of hourly files, and I already had downloaded the data before. Um, and it looks like I have two gigabytes of data, which is a rather large amount. And if I type the first file in the folder and I just look at the first five lines, you can see this scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. I've got a lot of um, columns there, but I don't actually care about all of them. And not only that, you'll see comma, space, comma. Many of them are actually missing values anyhow. But what I do care about when I actually get a chance to go through here is I care about the W band, which happens to be the weather station number. Um, and that's the way we identify the stations we care about. I need the date and time. They actually store it as separately, whereas at the um, uh, 
uh, energy um, load forecasting place, they store them date and time together. And then I care about the dry bulb Fahrenheit and the dew point Fahrenheit. If I were doing this in Europe, maybe I would switch it to Celsius, but it's the US, so most, most things are in Fahrenheit here. You can get it either way. It's in the, in, in the data set either way. And rather than say read all two gigabytes in at once, I'm going to say read in a million records at once. And then I'm going to tell it what formats, just in case it didn't know. And um, I'm going to preview the data. And here's what a preview of my five columns look like. Here's my station, my date, my time, and so on. And now I need to figure out, uh, oh, I need to tell you something. Remember all those stations that I downloaded for the weather? Well, they didn't, they weren't just New York. In each one of them, they had all the stations across the whole US in them. But I only need, if we went to the very top here, okay, I'm down about two thirds. Let me come back up here. Whoops. I only need um, about, uh, I don't know, a handful of stations, 15, 20 stations to cover the stations that are in New York City right now or New York State. So if I come back here, um, what I want to do is I want to find out these. I looked up the numbers. These are the stations that we care about. And if I take a look at them, there happen to be 17 of them. And all of the rest of that two gigabytes of data, I don't need right now. Now, I have a pretty nice beefy machine that MathWorks gave me. And even so, I don't want to load all that data at once. And so I'm going to use a concept called tall arrays. And this allows me to operate on my data in a way that I don't have to load all the data at once. If I happen to have parallel computing resources available, which I do because I started my parallel pool before and I mentioned it, I can process some of them in parallel. And if I were hooked up somehow to a cluster of the cloud, I could use the cloud that resource instead to do some of my computing on tall arrays. So you basically write your regular MATLAB code, but you tell it that the data is tall before you um, uh, actually work on the data. And so I'm going to take my data store. Remember, the data store is just a reference to that data in the file on my hard drive, and I'm making it tall. And it knows something about this data. When I come up, my click over here, here's what DSW thinks it is. It tells me a bunch of stuff. And I can come here now, and um, I can make it tall. In fact, I'm going to start running this now. And I can make the data tall. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to filter out and keep in the raw data the stations that match the stations I care about here that were on my station list. And we can see a little bit. Now notice when it's showing me a preview of the raw data, it says it's M by five because it hasn't read all the data yet. And it's not telling me how much um, it doesn't know how much there is yet. So it's just telling me there's a bunch, but it's five columns. And now I'm going to filter out. Um, those uh, unwanted stations. This was the raw data. This is the filtered out stations here. Notice my filtered station does not begin with 3011 because 3011 wasn't on that list, but 04725 was. So this is the first station we care about. And then I'm going to take the date and time and I'm going to merge them into a date time um, construct in MATLAB. And I'm going to make the time zone, notice America slash New York. And when I do that, it's going to take care of that whole um, time zone issue with daylight savings versus regular time. Um, so I'm taking care of that. And I'm going to also put the uh, uh, temperatures, the dry bulb and the dew point together. And so I have my station, date and time. And you can see it's basically once an hour at this station. And I get my two temperatures. And None of that would have been done until we typed this at last command, which was gather. What happens is all of the commands in between my tall and my gather get saved up. And as soon as I say gather, it says, OK, go use whatever resources you have available through my parallel pool to compute them. And you can see it figured out that it could do this in one pass. It didn't need an intermediate result. If it did, it would have maybe passed through the data two times or three times. So we try to be very economical about passing through the data more than we need to because that's expensive. And the next thing I want to do here after I get my data back is I, wanna, um, uh, I want to um, uh, reformat my table. And now you'll see that I have the date and time, and I have 
the station numbers here and they I'm getting a warning because you can't have a, a without asking to preserve you can't have a column name uh, beginning with a number so it puts an X in front so that's what all of that is about and you'll see um, the data that we have now when I first saw this I thought the weather the weather people are kind of strange look at this this one has a bunch of NANs at 45 minutes and 40, 51 minutes. And then it's got a reading at 53, which we saw before. And then it's got all these NANs at all these other times. And then it has another reading at an hour and 53. And this one has NANs at a different time and it collects its data at 56 and so on. And then I realized how smart the weather station was, uh, the weather um, uh, uh, system was. Uh, administration because what they did is they decided to not slam their servers. And so they basically have um, a, a, a time band in which the different um, stations report. And so they report at regular times once an hour, but staggered a little bit within a small time window. And so what we need to do is just coalesce them and get the, the non-NAN value for the hour to be the hourly value for each station. Um, because from the uh, weather uh, station's point of view, they haven't given us more data other than hourly. So that's probably the best we can do right now. Now, we then need to take our data, that's the load that's every five minutes, and our weather, which is once an hour, and we have to merge them. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to load in the full data sets that are already cleaned up here. And when I say cleaned up, we've what they, we've done is we put these into um, a hourly form too. And if you want, um, you can. There's code that you can do that with. And now I want to synchronize them, and I get to synchronize these two things in many different ways. I can look at synchronize to find out. But one is I could take the union, so I could do um, uh, all the values in one, all the values that are in all of them, and then fill in values if I want to. Uh, between or I could put NANs in there or whatever, or I could just do the intersection. In this case, I'm choosing to do the intersection um, because when we tried it ourselves to do this without um, uh, with, without uh, without downsampling, we didn't get a much better model and it took a lot more time because you can see these, these data are big. Let me come here and let me do this. Ugh. Hold on one second because my hand stuck to my mouse pad. So now um, you can see I have my weather table. It has 17 stations. My NYISO used to be smaller. Um, it had 11 in it and 12 for the time. Um, but I've got 17 more because I've got 17 weather stations in it now too. OK, so um, now if I think about this and I want to model the energy use in New York, I could put them into one big model all the different 11 regions. But that doesn't really make sense to me because they're operated independently. So what I'd rather do is I'd rather make 11 independent models and then you ask at any given time like that web app did, which region are you in? I'll use that model and give you the information. So I'm gonna pick um, a location to model from. And this one is gonna be New York City. And I'm gonna choose in this case, there's only one weather station in that region, and it's the LaGuardia one, KLGA. And I'm just going to change the column names um, for to make it easier to see what's going on. And now I need to think about creating predictors. And um, I told you some of what the predictors might be, uh, but I didn't tell you everything. So let's start thinking about this. Um, well. I need to know what hour of the day it is. I told you time of day might matter. And what month it is is kind of a proxy for the season. Um, you know, I guess if you're living in somewhere like Hawaii, maybe it doesn't matter, but that's not where we are. Um, year might matter. Some years are more severe or more mild than other years. I argued with you, the, I made the argument earlier with you that day of week might matter because our behavior is different on weekends versus weekdays. And I've represented that two ways. The weekday is just one through seven. And the is week, so it is what day of the week. And then the is weekend is a true or false, depending if it's a weekend day or not. OK. Um, and then I also want to get um, the temperature and the dew point out. 
So I'm going to pull those out separately instead of having them be in one column. And now um, I need to think about a few more things. Well, let me think about this. Well, as I've been sitting here, um, the weather hasn't changed much. My use of energy hasn't changed much. So my energy use, even like an hour ago, is not much different than it is now. So there's a correlation between my energy use from hour to hour and maybe day to day and maybe week to week, the week to week because of the weekends versus weekdays. So what I want to think about is pulling out um, uh, the hour of the day and um, and the basically the hours of the day. And so what I want to do, I have hourly data uh, now. And so I want to compute what's called the cross correlation. And I'm I'm gonna hope that Josh will tell me if my hand's not on screen because I have no idea. Um, if I were gonna do a correlation with the data and my data are represented by my fingers, what I would want to do is to do an autocorrelation. I simply, simply put my hand right on top of each other and I have 100% correlation, it's perfect. Um, if I wanted to then I can start off setting them and what you can see is I can see that they're not gonna be quite as well uh, um, correlated as I go. And so I'm going to compute that for the load um, for 200 lags. Well, why 200? Well, um, I'm going to compute that. Well, I need to get my predictors in here now. Let me come and get these built up. And I'm going to get my predictors in here, uh, my lag predictors. I want to explain what's going on. First of all, here's my autocorrelation. And it's a very high correlation because I never took the mean out. And I can use these tools so for example, I could use data tips and if I'm, if I'm having a good day, I'll get it. That was at X equals zero, it's 100% correlated. Look where it's next, it goes down and then up and that the next time 24 hours before it's 0.99 and you can see that the correlation goes down and then it rises and its next local high is over here, 168. 168 is 24 times seven. So 24 hours a day for a week. And so that's why I went 200 to just make sure I could see whether there was a weekly trend. Since there seems to be a weekly trend, I wanna actually put those data, the prior day and the prior, prior week into my model data as well. Okay, so we're at an hour folks, and I haven't even made a model yet because what's typical is you have to spend a ton of time pre-processing the data to get it into the form you need. But fortunately you can then save it and then spend a bunch of time modeling. But you can also see how useful MATLAB is with the pre-processing part, loading the data in and clear, cleaning it up so that you're ready to go. Okay, so now you're ready to model and um, you're gonna do a machine learning model. And for those of you who don't know much about the modeling, the reason that I'm gonna use some machine learning modeling is because there is no, I told you I'm a physicist, but there's no a model I know of that says, weather squared minus uh, the temperature the prior day um, and so on is gonna be my prediction for the load for the future. So I need to make some sort of statistical model and the load is basically continuous. So I need to make a regression model rather than a classification model. A classification model would be, tell me one of, what of each of these categories or five things does something belong to. Well, the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it two different ways. One, first is if you don't know much about um, uh, classification and regression at all, you're gonna probably go look something up online, maybe in the documentation, but you also have access to apps in MATLAB. And apps are kind of like, um, we've had apps for a long time, tasks are newer, tasks are sort of smaller than apps, but apps you'll see here, are, um, I have my favorites up here and they're organized. Those are just mine. And we have machine learning apps here. We have um, signal processing apps and so on. And you can see here, I put several apps for machine learning on my favorites list, including the regression learner app. And I'm gonna bring up the regression learner app and here it is. And the idea behind the app is it's gonna help lead me through the process of what I need to do to create a model. And so I'm gonna make a new session and I'm gonna have my data from the workspace and the data we've just been looking at is the model data. And what you see here is it tells me that my model is 77,000 by 11, that's fine. Um, and now it says that it's gonna to try to predict the prior week. 
I don't want to predict the prior week. I want to predict the load. So I'm going to simply come here and switch to the load. And now it's going to predict based on all the other things that I put in my model data. If I wanted to, I could take it, some of them out. Now, early on, I also said to you that even when I'm not making a statistical model, but one where I do parameter optimization, I need to somehow understand if that model is actually useful as a predictor. And so I need to do something called model validation. And I'm going to use holdout validation right now. And I'm going to hold out 10% of the data um, when I start this session. And what's going to happen is I'm going to make my model, which I have not made yet. This is just a plot of the data. I'm going to make my model um, from 90% of the data. And I'm saving 10% that it's never seen before to help me understand how well I've done with my modeling. Now, um, uh, we already made our features basically by pulling out those, those things like the prior hour and the prior day and things like that. Um, now, here are all the possible different ways I could do create a machine learning model. And if you were like me when I first saw this, I was not that well acquainted with all of them. You'll notice we I'm going to start from the bottom ensembles of trees. And at the end, uh, next to the end on many of these, you're going to see all ensembles, all Gaussian process models, all support vector machines, and so on. Up top, I can do everything, or I can choose all quick to train. And that is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to choose all quick to train. And you'll see that um, I have selected use parallel since it, I should be able to, and I'm going to hit train. And it's chosen four models, and it's going to work on those four models right now. And it's already got the linear regression. Linear regression is basically least squares. It's basically the idea of let's compute the one that we know really easily how to compute. Let's assume there's a linear relationship between all our inputs and our output. And then what model do we get? And you'll see. We get an RMSA, a root mean squared error, 429. And you'll see other measures of error down here. And it will tell you about the model. You'll also see that we calculated um, three different kinds of trees. And the fine tree has the most, uh, has the best, the least RMSE. But you'll see that the medium tree has only a little bit more RMSE, but it has um, fewer coefficients. It's a little bit, bit less complicated. So I might choose that one and take a look and see how the models and prediction look. And I can look, instead of just at the response, I can look at the predicted versus actual. If everything were perfect, we'd have a straight line there. And I could look at the residuals to see if there's any trends, maybe. When I get all done looking at these, I can say, oh, which one do I like? I like this one. And I can keep the figure if I want. I can export the model so I can use it in MATLAB. And I can also choose to make this so that it's reproducible and I can generate a function. And I just generated that code right now. And you can see that because it says auto-generated right now. I happen to be in the um, uh, time zone where it's noon right now. OK, so that's one way you can go ahead and use it. Um, now, um, that's fine. I'm going to close this. We don't need it. Because I want to show you the other way to do it as well. So I can use the app. And notice that I didn't need to be an expert at this. It's a really nice way to get information that I need. I can generate the code that we want. And so I can make the system not require point and clicking from someone else later on. Um, but I'm going to close that. That's fine. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to manually split the data into training and testing sets. And what you'll see here is I'm going to choose the year 2012 data as my test data set. Now, the reason I'm choosing a full year is because I want to make sure I have all the months represented. I don't actually have to choose one full year, though. I could and still meet that criteria by choosing a month from one year and a different month from another year, or mix the days across different months across different years. As long as I had every day of every year represented, I would have some hope of having covered that. But I am just loading in. Um, I'm just basically taking the year 2012 as my test data. And so that's going to be the data that we use for validation. And the rest of the data is going to be the data that we use to do the training. So I've got my training data, and I've got my test data. And um, we found um, 
by running all of the models at home that we would do best if we did a bag decision tree. Now, let me explain what a decision tree while this is calculating. A decision tree is actually a bunch of cascaded if else if statements. So it says something like, if um, the load yesterday was under 300 and if the load um, an hour ago was under 425 and if the temperature is greater than 37 and so on, so on, so on. When you get to the end, you say, then I think the load is, the predicted load is whatever it is. And you simply go down each branch of that tree and you can find it out. But remember to do this, we left out some data. Was there anything special about the data we left out? Hopefully not. And so if we left a different set of 10% of the data out, I'd get a different tree, but hopefully qualitatively similar. And so what we found out is that we didn't do much better um, with trees than if we calculated 30 of them and aggregate them. That's what tree bagger does. It does an aggregation. And then for reasons that I don't know, um, because I'm not in the energy industry, instead of using L RMSE or one of the other standard measures of error, they use mean absolute percent error. And if I come here, um, I can come and look at the map and we can say, find it. And you'll see it's a function that's sitting at the bottom of this live script. So I can put functions in my scripts, which you haven't been able to do before. Now, when I run this, you'll see that when I run the data with my training set, I get my MAPE to be, excuse me, 1.33%. I don't honestly know if that's great or not. I think it's pretty good though. But when I run it on my prediction set, I get 2.65, which is almost twice the size. That's a little scary. Um, so maybe my model's not any good. Well, before I throw my model out, I'd like to look a little further. And what I want to do is I'm going to plot the data and I'm going to plot the data for the, um, uh, the year of our training set, our test, excuse me, our test set 2012. And I'm going to plot the model and the data that it comes from. And here you see the, um, the outcome here. I've got the load. I've got the um, model. The model here in blue. I've got what really happened in red, and I've got the error in the model here at the bottom. Now I'm going to pop this figure out of the um, desk, uh, out of the MATLAB live script because I want you to be able to see this bigger. That's the best way I can do that right now. So hopefully you can see a much bigger picture now of what's going on. And you'll see the model does pretty well a lot of the time. We come here and let's do zoom in. Okay, but there, we can see now that there are some places where it doesn't do as well. Well, let's zoom in here. And when I zoom in, I've linked these plots and you'll see around April 17th, we have something that doesn't quite match. Well, what you probably don't know is that there's um, a holiday that some people uh, celebrate um, around that time, um, depends where you are, which celebrate, what you celebrate in Massachusetts, it's called Patriots Day in, um, other, uh, uh, other states. I'm not sure what they call it, but that's one place that I could look. Another thing that I could do is I could look at this next one. Maybe there's one here, whoops, here. And this one is around the date of Memorial Day, which is usually a three or four day weekend for us in the U.S. So our habits become different on those days that are holidays. Those days behave a little bit more weekend-like. Well, let me tell you some more of what's going on. So things don't behave quite the same at Christmas time because a lot of people take time off. Same for our Thanksgiving. But you'll notice there's a glaring mismatch here for quite a chunk here. So let me zoom in on that. And the dates are late October, October 29th, to November 2nd, 2012, New York City. And let me tell you what it is not. We hadn't had the election yet that year. It was not any sports event. It was not Patriots. It was not football. It was not basketball, hockey, or what did I leave out? Baseball, football? I don't know. If I missed one, I'm sorry, basketball. It wasn't any of those. It wasn't World Cup. It was not Halloween even. Even though kids may go out and get sick for one day, they don't disrupt things for five days. 
if you were to go to your favorite search engine, you would find out that it was Super Storm Sandy that had hit the US then. So am I sad that our model did not predict this? Well, emotionally, yes. But from a point of view of scientifically, no, because we didn't teach it anything about um, uh, storms. Which brings me to the last point I want to make on this, which is we could choose to teach it about the weekends. And if we do that, we actually get the, um, the, the model um, very closely cohering. The uh, MAPE goes down from 1.33 to a lot smaller. And then the MISFIT is pretty much all, if we leave this as the uh, test set, pretty much all because of um, Superstorm Sandy. So I'm gonna come back to my slide here. And um, let me go like this. And uh, let me just get rid of all these things so you're not distracted. So I talked to you a little bit about accessing the data so that we could then pre-process it. And the problem is, is that it's in so many different sources that it could be really hard to, to figure it out. You noticed I had to go to two different sources and download, but fortunately that's pretty easy to set up in MATLAB. And I was able to scrape the websites that way. After I get the data um, set up, um, you saw me use data so store to do the aggregation. And we have tools throughout MATLAB for helping you with different kinds of data and data that might be out of memory, like big data, show like I showed you with Tall. Um, and we show I showed you some point and kick click tools as well so far. Um, I didn't show you the import tool, but that's one way you can load in data. Um, but I have showed you um, um, some of the other tools that you can use. Um, now, um, the next thing we need to do is we have to take that data and get it into a model. And the part of the model is that many of us, like me, are scientists or engineers with a particular area of expertise that may not include data science to begin with. Um, does that mean we have to go find a data scientist? Well, maybe, but maybe not. We can figure out because we're domain experts, we know what features might be important even better than um, a data scientist who doesn't know our, our application area may know. And so this may, it takes a lot of time, but it needs um, people with expertise, domain expertise to do it. And then there's the model development and that does take time, but we have the apps and the tools to show you how to look at the data, create the different models, um, time to conduct the analysis by looking in the app and being able to use the app to help you with that. And you saw me a be able to take the data from the app and then be able to generate code from it so that we could then, if we had made our uh, model on a small amount of data, then we could then translate that and begin to use it on a much larger set of data um, with the same code that we had, just different data. So it lets us as non-data scientists bring our domain expertise and apply data science to the problem we're working on. The next thing um, we need to figure out is how to share. And this one gets harder. I mean, I showed you with the live script how you could, you could hand someone the code, the live script. You can also convert it into a PDF or something like that. Um, but you can also share it by generating not MATLAB code, because you might want to share this with people who are in a realm where MATLAB isn't the arena that they're going to be working in. And we can share it with other people who have other needs, either via an app or via code in another language. Okay, so um, the way I can get it out of MATLAB, there's a bunch of different ways. One is I can just use one of our coder products, which will allow me to generate um, standalone codes for C, C++ and so on here. And that will work on the algorithm. If I wanna work on exporting the entire um, uh, system, including the algorithm, including the graphics and things, I can deploy that to enterprise systems even if I need to make sure that it will connect through and link with people who are using other languages in order to work, whether that's through uh, Python or Java or C++. So you're gonna either use um, a coder or um, uh, uh, um, system product there. Okay, I just wanna make sure you know that we have um, MathWorks services that you might Think about we have a great group of consultants 
and trainers around the world. For those of you who are at educational institutions, we have a bunch of experts in uh, education as well who often come and visit you, even um, uh, not uh, even virtually at the moment. And so um, hopefully you're getting the help that you need. And it was my pleasure uh, to help you. I'm gonna just look for a moment at the questions here. Um, the question is, do you need any special add-ins or toolbox to work with machine learning or big data? Um, so thank you for asking the question. And the answer is yes, you need, need machine learning and statistics. Um, statistics and machine learning toolbox. And if you're working with large data and you want to take advantage of uh, all your cores or um, a parallel cluster and so on, you need the parallel computing toolbox and possibly the MATLAB parallel server. So potentially three things. And for many of you at schools with campus-wide licenses, you have access to all of those. Um, it looks like we may be done. So I want to Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we have put some links in the description below in the YouTube uh, page. And you uh, two in particular you might find interesting. Uh, first is the MATLAB X. Role. And secondly, if you're interested in learning more about Simulink, you might consider entering the Simulink Student Challenge that's happening soon, where you might win $1,000. Now, don't forget to subscribe to the MATLAB channel to get reminders for the next event. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.